Alrighty, good morning, everyone. So, as I mentioned earlier this weekend, yesterday, uh, so today we're just going to start the new stuff for the next exam. And then don't forget, exam is tomorrow. And I also did post the uh, solutions for the practice exam stuff. I think I did that yesterday. Thanks to uh, Grant for reminding me because I can never remember anything. So, anyways, those are posted. So, go ahead and use those to check the results. Make sure that you have a good understanding of what you're doing. So today we're going to start our conversation of our next foray, or at least for the stuff for our next exam, which is start looking at magnetic fields. Okay. So basically, what we're going to do today is start off by kind of comparing, contrasting magnetic fields to electric fields. Kind of talk about the similarities for them, the differences from them, <clears throat> and then from there we'll kind of move on and start talking about forces. So forces on things which have magnetic fields and exterior magnetic fields and all that kind of good stuff. So. Unfortunately, magnetic fields don't get the same amount of love as we give electric fields. So we just kind of say, this is what it looks like and let's move on from there. Uh, mostly because it's a lot more complicated than electric fields. So if we really told you about magnetic fields, we'd confuse the hell out of you and we don't want that to happen. So we basically just got to kind of contrast those things and talk about those. So first things first, magnetic field is denoted by a B. Don't ask me why, I have no idea. Uh, typically, M is reserved for what's known as magnetization. Um, so we're just going to denote magnetic fields by B, electric fields by E. For those of you in electrical engineering, you'll probably see it more as H in the future, which is what's known as an auxiliary field, which is related to the magnetic field. It's not quite the same thing. But anyways, a lot of people treat it as the same thing. But anyways, we're going to call it D. I'll shut up. So what then generates these two fields. So we know from going way back when, from chapter or from exam two, the source of an electric field is simply stationary charges. So if I have a stationary charge, that stationary charge then grooves off an electric field. What is then the generator of magnetic fields? We'll talk more about this in depth, but actually it turns out to that what generates a magnetic field is current, i.e. moving charges. Now, there's a big distinction actually between electric fields and magnetic fields here, where a charge, we're always going to find a single charge in space. Meaning, if I have a single charge in space, it's going to be either positive or negative or zero. But when it comes to magnetic fields, this is not true. So, actually, if you think about one generator of a magnetic field, which is a, mag a bar magnet, a bar magnet always has two charges. It has a north side and a south side, meaning it has two poles, unlike a single charge, which is what we call a monopole. So what would happen if I take this magnetic field and I chop it in half? So let's say, for example, I take this guy and I cut it in half. What happens to the bar magnet? Well, I'm going to get two bar magnets, basically. Right? So I'm going to get one bar magnet, which is here, which has a north side and a south side. I'm going to get another bar magnet here, which has a north side and a south side. What happens if I cut this one? Same thing. Now I'm going to get two smaller magnets, still north side, south side, north side, south side. What happens if I cut this? The same thing. No matter how many times I cut a magnet, at least a bar magnet, I can never isolate a single north side. And I can never isolate a single south side. So one thing that's going to be true then about magnets is there's a consequence of this, which is that there's no magnetic monopoles which means there is no single north side or single south side which is going to generate a magnetic field. This is basically impossible. What's always going to be true is that a magnet will always come as a dipole. Always. I'm always going to have a north side coupled with a south side, which has some pretty big drastic implications. But one thing I always found kind of funny about magnetic, at least no magnetic monopoles. So if you go through the history of the universe based off of when it started to now, as the universe expands and it cools, it undergoes what are known as phase transitions. So basically, in the early universe, it had such a high temperature that it had one particular type of symmetry. But as the universe expands and it cools down, the temperature starts to drop, the potential then changes, you undergo what's called a phase transition. This happens in water, right? When you boil water, you go from liquid water, you start to boil it, and it undergoes a phase transition, which brings you from liquid water to now vapor. Right? That's called a phase transition. So here, what ends up happening is whenever you go from one phase to a new phase, you create what's called a topological defect. 
It's basically a manifestation of something which is left over from the previous symmetry. A good example of this would be if you look at your windshield in the middle of the winter and your windshield say freezes or at least it gets frost on it and you look at the windshield you see these little cracks basically in the windshield. Those are what we call topological defects. So what's happening is that one part of your windshield is freezing, another part is freezing. Those two free things are freezing, but not exactly in the same way. And then eventually what will happen is those two freezing areas will meet with each other, but they don't match up exactly the same way, which then gives you these little cracks, which are called topological defects. Or if you look inside of the boiling water, you have little bubbles inside of that boiling water. Again, that's what's called a topological defect. It's manifestation of the old phase to the new phase. Point is, if you follow what we think happened way back in the early universe, when you went from the Big Bang to now what we have today, the topological defect would have been magnetic monopoles. But in reality, we've never actually found a magnetic monopole. We've always found bar magnets. Right? All we ever have are these dipoles. We never have a single north side all by itself, which means that something is wrong somewhere. So the way that we actually got rid of this is you do exactly the same thing you did when you were a kid and you make a mess. Anybody remember what you do with you made a mess when you were a kid? I can tell you I have two little monsters at home that do this all the time. They hide the mess. You don't pick it up. You just put a cover over top of it and say, I didn't do it. My sister did it. Right? That's what we did. So basically what's kind of funny about this is again, if you go back to the early universe after the Big Bang, what was left over should have been these magnetic monopoles. So we've never measured a magnetic monopole ever in reality. So the way that we hit it is we undergo inflation. So this was actually the original idea of inflation. Anybody ever heard of inflation before? No. Inflation is a period of expanded rates where the universe itself went from a probably an object about this big to nearly the size of which it is now. What's called inflation. So in a very short amount of time, you expand the hell out of the universe, make it huge. In that case, let's say you made 10 magnetic monopoles during the time of the Big Bang. Well, you still have 10 magnetic monopoles, but now your universe is so big, your, the probability of you measuring a magnetic monopole basically goes to zero. Because if I have 10 initially in this space, and now I make this space this big, the probability then of finding one of those 10 is practically zero. This was the original point of inflation. So the original point was inflation was to hide these magnetic monopoles, which are left over from a phase transition, because we know in nature, we've never actually measured a magnetic monopole. It's also kind of funny, a lot of our theories tell us we always should have magnetic monopoles, but we've never actually measured one. So anyways, that's a whole long story that you probably didn't care about, but that's fine. And I find it interesting. So anyways, so again, the point is, what's happening here is that we can never have magnetic monopoles. This is what's going to change some things for us when it comes to magnetic fields. But again, what actually generates magnetic fields is current or simply moving charges. So how do we detect these fields? Well, we know from before that the way we detect then an electric field is we put a point charge into the field, and then we measure the force. By simply looking then at the force, we can then determine exactly what the electric field should look like. So what do we do then with a magnetic field? What we do in the magnetic field is basically the same idea. What we do is we take something which has its own magnetic field, i.e. a compass, and then what we do is we move that compass around in our space, and as I move it from one location to another location, the compass then experiences a force, it rotates, it aligns itself with the external magnetic field, and then we say the direction of then the magnetic field is in the direction at which the north side of the magnet points. So here we would say, well, this is the north side of the Earth, but north always points to south, which means the north side of the Earth is the geometric north, but is the magnetic south, because north always has to point to south. So we do exactly the same thing. We're just looking at the force on an object, which in this case is a magnetic object, the direction at which that north pole points faces is the direction of the net magnetic field in that direction. So again, if I move it to a different location, so I move it here, again, this thing realigns itself, and then it points in the direction of north. So the direction at which the north side points is the direction of the overall magnetic field. 
So again, the way we detect it is exactly the same thing. So here we take a compass, place into an external magnetic field. The force causes a torque. So force causes a torque. And then again, the direction of the north side is the direction of the field. Direction of north is direction of net field. So this is how we actually detect these guys. We simply do the same kind of idea. We put something in there and look at the force. The next thing is, what about the field itself? Well, when it comes to electric fields, electric fields always move in straight lines. So electric fields always move in straight lines. Right? We know that because, again, if we put a positive charge here, we know our electric field then points radially away in all particular directions. So this is our electric field. So we had a negative charge. This thing then points radially inward from all directions to that negative field, or not to that negative charge. So here, electric field lines always move in straight lines. They begin on a positive charge and they end on a negative charge. For magnetic fields, it's a little bit different. The field is always circular. Always circular. There is no beginning, there is no end. So again, here it starts on a positive. Here it ends on a negative. Here it's circular, meaning there is no beginning and there is no end. Again, reason for that is everything is always a dipole. So here, again, if I look at my magnetic field, the magnetic field then would actually curl around into closed circular loops, where the direction of the magnetic field then would point away from the north side and then points down towards the south side. So at that point up there, that is the tangential direction of that point, which is the direction then of the magnetic field. So notice here how I drew it, the magnetic field actually goes through the object as well. So it curls around into closed circles. So this thing is always circular, creating closed loops. What else? What about the force? So here, we know the force is an indirect force when it comes to electric, indirect. So again, we can have two spatially separated charges. Those two spatially separated charges will feel a force because of the interaction of the electric field with the charge. When it comes to magnetic fields, this is also indirect. Again, I can create a force between these two star magnets when they are spatially separated away from each other. How do these forces interact? Well, we know that what? Like charges repel. And we know that unlike charges attract each other. Positive is attracted to negative. Negative is repelled from negative. When it comes to magnets, the same thing is true. So like poles repel and unlike poles attract each other. So So these are some comparisons then between electric and magnetic fields. Again, they are both fields, which means that they both are vector fields. They both have a direction and a magnitude at every location in space. The electric field is created by simply stationary charges. The magnetic field is created by moving charges. They both generate indirect forces, meaning action at a distance. They both repel when their poles are alike or charges are alike. They both attract when they are unlike. The major difference is, again, that the magnetic field is generated by moving charges with no magnetic monopoles, and that the fields are circular as opposed to straight lines. So these are kind of the main differences between them. So good. So let's first look at what is the magnetic field then from a straight wire? 
So we want to know magnetic field direction from a current carrying wire. So let's say I have a wire. So here's my wire. And we're going to run a current through this wire. So let's say I put some sort of current through this wire. So this is the direction of my current. So since this thing has current running through it, it is then going to generate a magnetic field. And I want to know, what does this magnetic field look like? Well, again, the way I would determine the way that this magnetic field looks like is I would simply put a bunch of compasses around this thing and see what happens then to the compass. So let's do that. When I say let's do that, let's watch somebody else again. So here is a video. So basically what's going on here is what? The north side is this direction, which means that the Earth's magnetic field in this case is pointing in this direction. <laughs> they have a wire. That's what this lovely blob is running through here. So initially it says, as we can read, current off. Now what they're going to do is they're going to run a current through it, which is going to cause all of these compasses to then rearrange themselves. We want to see what happens then. And then we'll talk about it. So again, here, all of them are pointing in the north direction. Now they're going to switch on the current. So what happens now is what? This one got rotated. This one was slightly rotated. This one is what? also slightly rotated. And then this one is drastically rotated. But if I look at the direction of the magnetic field, what this one is saying is that this is now the direction of north, direction of north, direction of north, direction of north. Which means that around this current carrying wire, the magnetic field then has to be circular. So if I follow the direction of all these compasses, this direction then has to be circular. So first thing we learned then is that the magnetic field for our current carrying wire then is a circular magnetic field around the wire perpendicular to the direction of the current. So from this video, we learned that what? the B field is circular around the wire, where it's perpendicular to the current. So meaning that if I drew this on here, this is going to create a circle that looks something like this. But my direction has to point one way. So it's either going to point at this point, either into the board or out of the board, depending on the direction. So how do I then determine the direction of the current? Well, we're going to write down what's known as right-hand rule number one. And just to get y'all pumped and psyched, we're going to have a lot of right-hand rules. Three to be exact. So let's talk about right-hand rule number one. So, to determine the direction at which this magnetic field is curling, we know it's curling around this wire. So the question is, is it going this way or is it going this way? So if I'm looking down on it, is it going to counterclockwise or is it going this way, which is clockwise? Well, the way we do this is what's called the right hand rule number one. So first thing is, which hand do I use? The right hand, good, okay. Right hand rule. So what we're going to do is determine the direction in which the magnetic field is curling. You put your thumb in the direction in which the current is flowing and your fingers curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, if I was using this as my wire, so here, let's say the wire has current going in this direction. I would basically grab the wire with my thumb pointing in the direction of the current and my fingers then wrap around in the direction of the magnetic field. So if I was looking at it like this, they would be going in the counterclockwise direction. So this is right hand number one, rule number one. So step number one, point thumb in direction, I'm gonna spell, of I, step number two, fingers curl in direction of B. So this is right hand rule number one. So in this case, I put my thumb in the direction of the current, my fingers would then curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which means in this case, my magnetic field would then point in this direction. This is the direction of my magnetic field. 
So at that point, or if I was talking about this point over here, it would then point in this direction, this direction, this direction. So this is the direction of my magnetic field. Okay. So let's do a couple more examples on the next page. So let's say here's my wire. So let's say I'm looking now at the wire from a cross-sectional area of it. And let's say my current is coming out of the page. So this is the direction of my current. So basically anytime I draw a dot or a dot with a circle around it, that means that the current is coming out. Right? So think of it as looking at an arrowhead coming directly at your face. Not quite something you want, but that's fine. So this means it's coming out. So again, here, the way I've determined the direction of the magnetic field is I put my thumb in the direction of the current. So in this case, I'd have my thumb pointing away from the board. My fingers would then curl around in the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, my magnetic field would point this way. This is my B field. Another example, if this is my wire, let's say I still have my current, but let's say my current is going in. So in this case, I'm going to draw an in by x. So this means in. So again, think about an arrow. This is the quiver of the arrow. So you're looking at the back side of the arrow. So in this case, again, I point my thumb in the direction of the current. So my thumb would have to point into the direction of the board. My fingers would curl around in the direction of the magnetic field, which means in this case, my magnetic field would curl in the opposite direction. So this would be clockwise, and this would be counterclockwise. So this is right hand rule number one. So to determine the direction of the magnetic field of a current carrying wire, this is how we do it. Now, what happens if this magnetic field, which is generated by current carrying wire, is placed into an external magnetic field? So the next thing we want to know is what happens to a current carrying wire when placed into an external B field. What happens in this case? Now here, we already know the answer to this. We've actually shown it to you before. So hopefully, again, we can kind of see it. But remember last time when I showed you this guy, the cathode ray tube? So again, here, we we're looking at the force that caused the charged particles to move across which had to do with the potential difference doing work basically on these guys. But here, I want to talk about the same thing. So again, you can see the beam, at least I saw it for a second, was going through here. And now I'm going to play with this magnet. And if you look at the magnet, the result, this thing is constantly moving up and down. It's changing directions. It's doing all kinds of different things. Everybody kind of see that? So here it's going up and through this direction at this stage, causing it to wobble. Hopefully everybody can kind of see that. This is effectively a wire carrying current inside an external magnetic field. So what you can see here is that my putting another magnetic field into the presence of that actually generates a force onto that current carrying wire. So we want to know then what is the force on this current carrying wire. So when we place this guy into an external magnetic field, this then generates a force. This generates a force. So we then want to know what is the force then on this current carrying wire. So to do this, let's do a few experiments. So let's say here's my wire. And then let's say my current for the first part is moving in this direction. So experiment number one. So let's do some experiments. So here, for experiment number one, what we're going to do is we're going to take our external magnetic field and I'm going to put it in the same direction as the current. So this is experiment number one. So here, we're going to have that the current is parallel to the external magnetic field. And we'll talk about what happens. Experiment number two. We're then going to rotate the magnetic field so that the magnetic field is now at an angle of theta relative to the current. So 
here I still have my current, but the current is not parallel to this external magnetic field. Experiment number three. We're going to change the direction of the current. I'm going to use gray. So now I'm going to change the direction of the current. So here, we're going to let the current go to negative of the current. Okay, just switch the direction and see what happens. Experiment number four. We're going to increase the length of the wire in the external magnetic field. So if this is the length of the wire, so we call this the length of my wire. Let's say I put more of the wire inside of the external magnetic field. Experiment number five is we're simply going to throw my pen across the table. There we go. Increase the current. Okay. So I want to increase the magnitude of the current and see what happens to the force. So good. So let's talk about each one of these experiments. So let's talk about the results of the experiments. Result of experiment number one is that there is no force. The force is simply zero. So here, if the external magnetic field is parallel to the current, that results itself in zero force. Experiment number two. When it is not perpendicular, the force is then no longer equal to zero and it has its maximum force when the angle is equal to 90 degrees. Okay. Experiment number three. Experiment number three, what we find is that the force changes direction. The force now points in the opposite direction. Experiment number four. We find that if the length increases, the magnitude of the force also increases. So the more amount of wire that I put inside of the external magnetic field, or the larger the region of the external magnetic field, the greater the force becomes. Experiment number five. If I increase the current, meaning if I increase the magnetic field of the wire, the magnetic field of the force, or sorry, magnetic field, magnitude of the force also increases. So let's talk about each one of these experiments and what do they actually tell us? So let's talk about the first two. The first two tell us that what? The force must be or proportional to sine of the angle. So these two together tell me that the force must be proportional to, at least the magnitude of the force, sine of the angle. Because again, when sine is equal to zero, or sine of zero is equal to zero, sine of 90 is equal to one, so that gives me then the maximum number. What about the next one? This one tells me that's what? The force, or at least magnitude is directly proportional to the length of the wire. This one tells me the force is proportional to the current. And if we did one more experiment, let's talk about experiment six. If I increase the strength of the external magnetic field, the force also increases. And this one finally tells me that the force, the magnitude of the force then is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. So if I put all these things together, what this tells me then is that the force on the wire then must be proportional to, at least magnitude wise, the length times the current times the external magnetic field times sine of the angle between the two. But let's mathematically think about sine. Where, what mathematical process usually gives us a sign? So what I mean by that is, think of your cross products and your dot products. Right? Remember that a dot product, if I multiply two things together by a dot product, that takes two vectors and puts them into a scalar quantity. And where the dot product usually goes what? Sine or cosine? Cosine, right? 
which means that this one, since it goes with a sign, actually is going to be a cross product. The other reason I know that is because this is a vector, this guy's a vector, this guy's a scalar, but this guy I'm going to promote to a vector. So in mathematical terms, what this tells me then is that the force on a current carrying wire by an external magnetic field is then equal to the current times the length crossed by the external magnetic field. So what is L? So L then is a vector which is going to point in the direction of the current where the magnitude of it is the length of the wire itself. So if this wire has a length of L, L vector then is going to be a vector which points in the direction of the current and the magnitude of that length vector is simply equal to the length of the wire. Basically, we have to do that because our definition of current is it's a scalar quantity. So we have to introduce some other vector. So this vector then is simply going to be the length vector, which is then, again, pointing in the direction of the current. So this guy points in the direction of current. But again, its magnitude is equal to the length of the wire itself. How else do I know that this thing has to be a cross product? Well, Experiment number three. Experiment number three says that if I change the direction of the current, in that case, I have to change the direction of the force. But if I change the direction of the current, I have to multiply that force by a negative value, which means it has to be a cross product. So now this is technically only true. So let's put an asterisk here for a straight wire in a constant B field. So the next question then is, well, this is only true for a straight wire in a constant magnetic field. What happens if the wire is not straight? Or what happens if the external magnetic field is non-constant? Well, in that case, what we'd have to do is chop this thing up into a whole bunch of small sections, find the force on each one of those small sections, and then simply sum them all together. So let's say I have both. So here's my wire, which is non-straight, and something like this, in an external magnetic field, which say is position dependent. So this is my external magnetic field. So what do I have to do in this case? Well, what I would have to do then is again, chop this thing up into a bunch of small pieces. So this is my small piece. So this is going to have a length of DL. So DL then is going to point in the direction of the currents locally. So let's say my current's going this way. So in this case, DL will point in this direction. This is the direction of DL. My magnetic field then locally at this point is going to point in this direction, so this is B, and that's going to give me an angle of theta here. <clears throat> so basically what this says then is that the differential amount of force at this particular location then is going to be the current times DL crossed by this external magnetic field. So this is the differential amount of force on this little tiny piece here. But I'm going to cut this thing up into a whole bunch of small other pieces and then simply sum them all together, which means the total force then is going to be equal to the integral of the differential forces, summing them all together, which is then going to be equal to the integral of the current DL cross B. So this is then the force on a current carrying wire in general. So this thing doesn't have to be straight. It doesn't have to be a constant magnetic field. In this case, again, we would physically chop this thing up into a whole bunch of small DLs. Calculate the force on each one of these different little DLs, which is what we call DF. Send them all together, which means we're going to do an integral. So this is the force on a wire. Now, how do we determine the direction of the force? So how do we determine the direction? The direction of the force then comes from what we're going to call right hand rule number two. That's right, right hand rule number two. So, what's right hand rule number two? So, let's say I have three vectors. Let's do this more in general. So, let's say I have vector A, I have vector B, and I have vector C. So, if we take vector A crossed by vector B, that then gives us vector C. So what right hand rule number two says is step number one, we're going to point 
fingers in direction of A, the first vector. Step number two, curl fingers in direction of B for the smallest angle. So whatever is going to get us there with the shorter amount of distance. Step number three, thumb, which is perpendicular to our hand, points in direction of the resultant vector, which is vector C. Now, if you have learned a different way in Calc 3 to do right-hand rules, that is absolutely fine if you're happy with that. Some people do the finger method, use three different fingers. Some people do a push method, put your fingers in the direction of the first, push towards the second one, and then your thumb. Whatever method you have learned is absolutely fine with me. So if you want to use that instead of this, this is just easier for me to kind of remember. I like the curling kind of method. Okay? So let's do a few examples of this, and let's see how this kind of works. So let's do a first example. So if, let's say that vector A points in this direction, and let's say, I don't know, vector B points in this direction. So what I want to know is what is the direction of vector C? Now, the way that this works, again, is you would point your fingers in the direction of the first vector, which is vector A. So my fingers point in this direction. Now, I want to curl my fingers in the direction of B in the direction of the smallest angle, which means I have to rotate my palm towards B, curl them towards B, my thumb, which is 90 degrees from my hand, then points in the direction of C. So in this case, C will point off in this direction. So this is vector C. Okay with this? We'll talk about some general properties of cross products here in a second. Let's do another example or two. So let's say vector A points this way, and let's point, I don't know, vector B into the board. What's the direction of C? So what's the direction of C? Uh, Good deal. Everybody got it? Let's take a shot. What do you think, Richie? What's the direction of C? Upward, good. So C points up. Let's do another one. Let's say A points this way, B points this way. What's the direction of C? What's the direction of C? What do you think? Joe, what do you think? It's actually a trick question. It's actually zero. There is no vector C. Why is that? Because vector A and vector B are anti-parallel with each other. Sine of 180 degrees is zero, which means there is no vector C in this case. Vector C is actually equal to zero. There is no vector C in this case. That was somewhat unfair. So let's do another one that's a bit more fair. So let's say that I don't know, vector A points out of the board. And let's do vector B points, I don't know, let's say downward. This is vector B. So this one's not a true. What's the direction of C in this case? So A points towards you, B is downward. Good. That's right. Good job, Joe. So C points this way. So this is right hand rule number two. So this would be the direction of our force. For us, vector A then would be the direction of L, vector B would still be B, the external magnetic field, and then C then would be the direction of the force. And so our force is always going to be given by the thumb. Now, again, which hand do we use? Right hand, right? What happens if we use the left hand? 
we would get the wrong direction. We get the wrong direction by 180 degrees. So let's talk about some general properties of cross products just before we move on. So properties of cross products. So first things first is vector C will be perpendicular to A and vector C will be perpendicular to B. So for a cross product, what's always true is that vector C C will be per perpendicular to both vectors A and B simultaneously, which means that if A was pointing this way and then B was pointing this way, so this was B, so I do A, B, which means in this case, again, vector C would point into the board in this case, so this would be the direction of vector C. Okay? Vector C then is perpendicular to both A and B by definition. It has to be perpendicular to both of them. Okay. So this is property number one. Property number two is then that vectors A and B form a plane and C is perpendicular to that plane. So this is property number two. So these guys are forming a plane. In this case, this would be say the XY plane and then C has to be perpendicular to that by definition, which means that if X and or A and B are living in the X, Y plane, C then has to be in the Z plane, either in the negative Z or in the positive Z direction. Property number three, the magnitude of A cross B is then equal to the area of the Parallel pipe bed, or let's see, what do I call that? We'll call it a trapezoid. There we go. Trapezoid. Parallel pipe bed is three dimensional. Uh, trapezoid formed by A and B. So in this case, what that means is I would extend B, say, in this direction, extend A in this direction. This thing creates a trapezoid. The cross product magnitude tells me the area of this. So this is the area of this trapezoid. So this is the area of a cross product. Okay. So these are some kind of general properties of this guy. So again, we now know that the force on a current carrying wire is in general equal to the integral of the current DL crossed by the external magnetic field. But again, this is equal to I times L cross B. Again, if it's straight. And B is constant. So let's do an example. Oops, my camera. So this says we have a rectangular loop of wire hangs vertically in an external magnetic field. A uniform external magnetic field is directed horizontally perpendicular to the wire and points towards you at all points. Okay, so let's start drawing our picture. So you kind of understand what's going on here. So this says I have a rectangular wire. Here's my rectangular wire. This is in an external magnetic field, which is perpendicular to the wire and points at us at all locations. So this is our picture. Okay. So then it says, if a portion of the wire is L equals 10 centimeters long, a downward force is determined to have a magnitude of 3.48 times 10 to the minus two newtons. Okay, so let's kind of draw it. So what this is saying then is that here, I find a force where the magnitude of this force then is pointing downward, which is 3.48 times 10 to the minus two Newton. So this is the magnitude of that force. And this part here has a length L, where L is equal to 10 centimeters. <coughs> but this thing also carries a current carries a current where the magnitude of that current is 0.245 amps. 
So the first thing we want to know is what is the direction of the current inside of the wire? And then the second thing we want to know is what is the magnitude of the magnetic field to generate this particular force? So good, we know somewhere inside of here, this thing has a current I, which is equal to 0 0.245 amps. So we want to know then is for this to generate a magnetic force pointing downward, is the current then moving in this direction or is it moving in this direction? This is the first thing we want to determine. From there, we then want to determine what is the magnitude of this magnetic field. So this is what we want to know. So the first part is an application of the right hand rule. Now, this is a little bit backwards because here I'm not telling you the direction of L, which is the first vector. I'm telling you the direction of B, which is the second vector and the resultant vector C. So let's think about this. So first, if it's on this bottom part here, it means I have currents can either be going to the right for you guys or left. So let's just kind of think about if it goes this direction. So let's think about if it's going in this direction. Could this be a possible direction? Well, again, according to our force, we point our fingers in the direction of the current, i.e. L. We would then curl towards the external magnetic field. So we'd have to rotate our palm in this direction, curl towards the external magnetic field. Our thumb would then point down in this direction, which means, is that the correct direction? Yes, because we know our force is downward. If we chose the other direction, we'd have to point our fingers this way, curl towards the external magnetic field. Our thumb would point upward, which is the wrong direction of the force. So in this case, the direction of our force has to be to the right. So first thing we know is that the current has to point to the right. Okay? Not too bad. What about the magnitude of the force? Well, we now know that the force on the wire is equal to the current times the length crossed by the external magnetic field, which means that the magnitude of the force is equal to the current times magnitude of the length, times the magnitude of the magnetic field, times sine of the angle between the two. Now, remember that the angle here is the angle specifically between the current and the external magnetic field, which means, again, if my current is pointing in this direction, i.e. L is pointing this way, my magnetic field points this way, my angle then theta is the angle specifically between these two. So here, what do we know? We know the current is pointing in this direction. We know the magnetic field is pointing this way. So what's the angle between the two of those? It's 90, good. So in this case, what side of 90? One, good. So here we know that the angle between those two is simply 90 degrees. So this is the same thing as I times L times B. So solve this for B. This says that the magnitude of the magnetic field is simply equal to the magnitude of the force divided by the current times the length. So this is equal to 3.48 times 10 to the minus two divided by 0 0.245 times 0.1. Whole lot of numbers we should go with this thing tells us, which is 1.42 something. This is what we call capital T, which is called a Tesla. So the units of a magnetic field, so a magnetic field has units of what's known as capital T, which is equal to a Tesla. So this is the units of a magnetic field. There are, of course, other units of magnetic fields. This is the SI unit. Another type of unit is what's called a Gauss, but we won't pay too much attention to Gauss since we don't use them too often. But. Uh, just to give you kind of a size of this, so this being 1.42 Teslas, the strength of the electric, or sorry, the magnetic field on the surface of the earth is roughly about five times 10 to the minus five Teslas. So this is pretty huge compared to that guy. Your typical bar magnet, one that you would put on your refrigerator, that one's usually about a half a Tesla, something like that, Tesla, half a Tesla to like a Tesla. So this is about the size of the part. So we have one more example, but I definitely only have one minute to do that, and it's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, the next one involves an integral, so we'll do that Monday after the exam, so it will be great. 
Okay. Any last minute questions on anything? You got one? What do you got for So in your topic, yes. What current life is going through R3? Well, it's the same thing that's going through R1. Because all this in here is in series. Okay. But again, when you write this here, all you're writing down is the coefficients from these equations. So that means then that if you're looking at the first equation, you have R1 plus R2. So I1 here is going to be R1 plus R2. Right, because they're both multiplied by I1. By I1, okay. yes, correct. Yeah. Okay. Now it doesn't have a. Yeah, this is nice. Okay. Okay. So I, I couldn't figure out what current you want. Yeah. Okay. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. So it's because they're in code. Yes. Are they in series? Yes. Okay. Thank right. you. You're welcome. Okay, so we're looking for those numbers. Yes. Also, oh. Oh, so what's the um, homework it says charge potential? Charge. Charge. Well, charge is completely different. Uh, so charge just talks about the number of yeah. charges that an object has. Potential then is the potential between two things, which is related to potential energy. So potential then is the potential energy per Units uh, charge. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, current is that. Charge is that. So potential is speed. That's it. Uh, those are your two A maps. So E1 was 80 and E2 was 45. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well done, Michael. Right, so I'm morning. Okay. So he's doing six. So yeah, so he's just kind of worried about. <laughs> no, it. Worried. Getting here on time. I have you. Gotcha. Uh, um, is there like another section like class that you don't feel like if I get started? No. Um, I guess at this stage we'll kind of play by ear. Okay. Um, I'm pretty. I have class. Right after class. Okay. So maybe if you have office hours. Uh, Fridays, unfortunately, are bad.